Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we'll be looking at the Persian Empire in our ongoing study of ancient history as a framework for the Bible. We left off looking at Babylon and that great city that for a short time ruled the world. But that is going to come to an end with the rise of the Medes and the Persians, a combined kingdom that turns into an empire. How did they come about? We how do we get from Belshazzar, mentioned in the book of Daniel, uh, with the Jews having been taken into captivity, uh, the handwriting on the wall, and uh, suddenly the Babylonian Empire is no more. One story that's told, but unfortunately it's a story told many hundreds of years later, and y you wonder how true it is, that uh, Cyrus the Great captured the city of Babylon by drying up, the, diverting up the, the waters of the Euphrates and marching his soldiers through the dry riverbed. It's a, it's a great story, but as I said, it's told many hundreds of years later, and, and we're not sure about the veracity of it, especially in that we have Cyrus's own account, and that tactic is notably absent from his telling of the story. Cyrus the Great, to understand him, we have to go back uh, a, a generation or two to the Medes and the Persians when they were two separate kingdoms. The Medes were ruled by Astyages and he was exercising lordship. He had, uh, he had uh, sort of imposed a treaty over the Persians and they bound that treaty uh, by way of marriage. So it was a friendly treaty even though he was the big king and the Persians uh, their king was a, you know, a bit smaller. Uh, but Astyages uh, sealed this alliance with marriage, the marriage of his daughter, to the Persian king Cambyses. Now, we're going to see a later Cambyses, but uh, that's not the one here. Uh, we're not going to speak much of him. Um, his claim to fame is that the two of them have a child, and he's going to be Cyrus the Great. But while Mandani, the daughter of Astyages, was pregnant, he had a dream, and I'm not going to get into the specifics of the dream, but it was... It was such that it had him so puzzled and befuddled that he went to the Magi, the wise men of the day, and he asked them what it meant, and they told him that the child that was going to be born would be a great ruler, so great that he would unseat Astyages himself. Astyages didn't care for that story, and so he ordered that the young child be taken and killed. However, the man that he appointed... Harpagus, uh, to take the young Cyrus and have him put to death. Uh, he took the child, gave it to a farmer with the orders, you know, go ahead and, and abandon the, uh, the child, leave it out to be, uh, to be exposed. And that farmer's wife had just had a child of his own. And so uh, they took, you know, their child, who had died in childbirth, been stillborn, uh, they took that child, sort of passed off, as the as the young Cyrus said, see, he's dead. Uh, and they took Cyrus and raised him as their own. The story goes, though, as time went on, um, the young Cyrus, as he, he grew to boyhood, uh, had a very noble bearing. And somehow, uh, in the process of time, uh, he came before, t came to the attention of King Astyages. And Astyages looked at him and said, you know, you look a bit like I, you look a bit like me, you act a bit like me. How did this come about? Um, you, who are your parents? And, and he investigated, and it was found out that this young Cyrus was indeed the grandson of Astyages. Well, by this time he had grown fond of the boy, and so he let him live, he let him grow to manhood. And when Cyrus grew to manhood, again the story goes, that he uh, not only became king of the Persians, but he eventually came against his grandfather and became king of the Medes as well. Now, we read in the, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, verse 31, speaking of the fall of Babylon, says that Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. Notice that the Bible doesn't say anything about Cyrus, not at least in that passage. It's possible that Darius the Mede, mentioned in this verse, was an early governor of Babylon who was operating under Cyrus, maybe one of his generals, one of his, one of his governors. I think the more likely answer is that this reference to Darius the Mede, that that was another name for Cyrus. Because we know that Cyrus takes Babylon, and he's about 62 years old when he does so. Now, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 22 
tells us that one of the very first things that Cyrus does in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, not that Cyrus was trying to do that, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom. The proclamation was that Israel, the Israelites, the Jews, could go back to the land and that they could rebuild their temple. Now you say, well, that's wonderful. Does that mean he was a believer in God? Well, maybe, but maybe not, because we have in the Cyrus prism, that is a, um, a stone carving that ha is, is carved with cuneiform, sort of in a rounded shape, looks a little bit like a, a big football. Uh, and on this, on this uh, monument, we have an inscription from Cyrus to all the nations, and he's basically saying th the same thing to all the nations that are under his domain. Uh, all those nations that had been dispossessed by those mean old Babylonians had been taken into captivity, like the Jews, but like others as well. He says, you can all go back home, and you can rebuild your cities, and you can rebuild your temples, and be sure you send me your taxes. So uh, he presents himself as a liberator rather than a conqueror. Now, people like to ask, what happened to the Ark of the Covenant? You see, it's not referenced again after the book of Jeremiah. It had been destroyed, or at least the temple had been destroyed, by Nebuchadnezzar. Um, most people think, well, the Ark was destroyed too because it was in the temple. Um, there are some who have suggested, well, gee, maybe it was carried down to Egypt. After all, some Israelites uh, eventually escape and run down to Egypt and, and set up shop there. And, and we talked already, and we'll talk again about the elephantine papyri. Uh, down in southern Egypt. Um, there's uh, one story that's in the uh, book of Maccabees, how the ark was hidden over on the east side of the Jordan River, somewhere in the land of modern-day Jordan, uh, and it you know, was hidden for protection, but then it was never found again. Uh, in, in other words, the ark, it, it sort of disappears from the pages of history. Going back to Cyrus, Cyrus is going to conquer pretty much the whole known world, um, he finally dies in a battle. He's almost 70 years old by this time. And he is buried in a tomb with the inscription that says, Mortal, I am Cyrus, son of Cambyses, who founded the Persian Empire and was Lord of Asia. Grudge me not, then, my monument. Now his son Cambyses comes to the throne. Although Cambyses does have a brother, and one of the early things that happens under Cambyses, not that he has any attention to it, but it's under his reign, that the temple that the Jews are rebuilding in the book of Ezra, the construction is halted. There's a, I guess the ancient equivalent of building permits, although there were more insidious reasons than that. But the temple, uh, they had gone back to the land, they had started building the temple, and that construction is halted, and the temple remains for a number of years in a half-finished state. Meanwhile, Cambyses, in order to secure his position on the throne, secretly murders his brother Smyrdas. But he doesn't make it well known, well documented, that this murder has taken place. And that's going to come back to haunt him. Next, Cambyses goes and invades Egypt. He establishes himself in Egypt as the beginning of the 27th dynasty. He's ruling Egypt as one of the pharaohs. Um, and, and certainly that's, that's a hostile takeover, but they roll with it, and they're, they're, um, the temple priests in Egypt, they, they honor him and, and pretend he's one of the pharaohs and worship him as a god. He even goes to uh, send some troops, according to records, 50,000 Persians set off from Egypt going west to invade Carthage. And they never are heard from again. They are lost in the desert. Perhaps one of these days somebody's going to discover some of the remains, or if not the remains, at least some of the tools and implements out in the middle of the desert of that lost Persian army. In any case, Cambyses, um, while he is in Egypt, he hears some disturbing news. Cambyses hears the news that his brother Smyrdas has taken the throne back in Persia. Well, he knows that he has put Smyrdas to death, 
And so apparently somebody is pretending to be Smyrtus. Remember, you don't have televisions and photographs, so it's, you know you can pull that sort of thing off back then. And somebody apparently is pretending to be Smyrtus, and Cambyses hops on his horse, get, and he's in such a hurry, he, he has a, an accident, at least that's the way the story goes, uh, stabs himself by mistake, it gets infected, and he dies. So we have now this Smyrtus, or, or at least one pretending to be Smyrtus, on the throne of the Persian Empire. There's a palace revolt that takes place, and one of the distant cousins, now we haven't looked at this chart, you've still got uh, Cyrus the Great in, in the middle, but notice far to the right there's a, uh, a distant, you know, second or third cousin, however many, you know, f however, however far removed, by the name of Darius Hystaspes. He's going to be Darius the Great. And Darius, like I said, he makes a big deal of the fact, well, I'm, I'm in the royal family. I'm way on the edge, but I'm still in that royal family. Darius leads a coup against this pseudo Smyrtus and kills him and then takes over, establishing himself on the throne, saying, it's still part of the same family, but, but on the distant side. And Darius now becomes the king of the Persian Empire. So Darius the Great, and uh, immediately, by this time, the, the Persian Empire is, is beginning to just fall apart. There are revolts everywhere. Uh, he captures Babylon. The story of how he does this is quite interesting, where uh, the story goes that he sends one of his uh, generals and who pretends that he's been disgraced, actually has his nose and ears cut off. Uh, see what that battle Darius did to me? And uh, goes into Babylon, and they say, well, we could use you uh, and your help. And uh, as soon as he's in charge, he opens the gates and lets Darius in. Um, uh, what he isn't willing to do for his kin. But he captures Babylon in any case. Uh, he conducts a reorganization of the government uh, so that the government of the Medo-Persian Empire, because now it's a combined empire, is going to um, be a wonderful political machine that will last for the next 200 years. Um, he, it's during his time that the temple is completed. Uh, in fact, what happens, and we'll look at this uh, in a, at a later time, where the prophets uh, Haggai and Zechariah begin preaching, and, and they say, you need to rebuild the temple. And the Jews do it without permission. And a, uh, uh, an order goes out that says, hey, these Jews are rebelling. They're, they're building the temple without having gotten permission. And Darius orders an investigation made. And in the investigation, uh, it comes up that Cyrus had originally given them permission to rebuild their temple. And he says, well, in that case, you can, you can do it. Not only that, we're going we're gonna to pay for it. So the temple is completed 516 B.C. That's during the, uh, the reign of Darius. And he also has palaces made. Uh, both at Susa, which there was already possible, but also a, uh, I, I guess a sister city you could call it, Persepolis. You can uh, go to the ruins of Persepolis, where in the past there was a, uh, a huge city and a huge palace there. The name Persepolis, uh, names, polis is a word for city, so it's just the city of the Persians. And you can go and see these magnificent ruins at Persepolis, uh, where Darius, where Darius was involved in uh, building. Here we've got a, uh, an image of one of the gods that they worshipped. Uh, notice he's pictured up, you know, on a wheel with wings. You know, he can, in other words, he can go from one end of the empire to the other. Uh, a marvelous city that is constructed here as, uh, as sort of a, a second home for Darius. Now, the empire of Darius, then, is going to stretch from the borders of Greece all the way to the borders of India. It's the greatest empire the world had ever seen to that day. To get news from one end to the other, he organizes a postal system. And Herodotus, describing that system, says, you know, these, uh, these postal workers, uh, these messengers, they are stayed neither by snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor darkness from accomplishing their appointed courses with all speed. Sounds a little bit like our postal system. 
An inscription is placed upon a cliff near the village of, Bis of Behistun. Uh, I have the date of 1842. It's not the first time that anybody noticed it, but it was the first time it was carefully studied by Europeans. Uh, here we're looking at the ground. If you if you look up to the top, you can barely see the inscription. Uh, it's uh, you know three or four hundred, about 300 feet uh, above the uh, above the surrounding plain. Here's a blow up of that, and in that inscription, Cyrus tells the story of how he came to power and uh, how Ahura Mazda, the the god that they worship, uh, was was instrumental in bringing him to power and oversaw him, and he got rid of that that nasty old pseudo Smyrdas and set himself up because after all, he's the you know fifth cousin twice removed from from King Cyrus. The inscription was studied by Sir Henry Rawlinson in 1835. Uh, it was later studied in uh, 1946 by George Cameron, who, who made further copies. Rawlinson had to climb up there. Uh, either he climbed or maybe had one of his workers climb up there and, and stand on this rickety old ladder. It's a modern-day photo of, uh, I'm not sure how these kids made it up there, but uh, they were able to go up onto that area. You can imagine leaning up a ladder and climbing way up to the top to get all of the inscription copied. The inscription is what's significant about it. It's in three languages. It is in Old Persian. It is also in Elamite. And it is in Akkadian. Now, it was the fact that it was in Old Persian, because Persian was called Persian, in fact, the, the country of Persia was called by that name until the 1920s, uh, less than 100 years ago. Um, and nowadays, that country is called Iran. Um, but Old Persian was a language that people could read, and because the same inscription was written in three languages, they could read the Persian, and then they could study both the Elamite and the Ac especially the Akkadian cuneiform, and they could puzzle it out, and it became uh, a way to crack the Akkadian cuneiform language. So that this Behistun inscription was to Mesopotamia what the Rosetta Stone was to Egypt. It allowed them to understand the language. Now, Cyrus had a problem. Uh, with his great empire, you know, there was peace from, relative peace from one end to the other, except that uh, between the Black and Caspian Seas, you had a group known as the Scythians. Um, the Scythians were sort of no, semi-nomadic. Uh, they, uh, you know, rode horses instead of just having them pulled around uh, on chariots like normal folk. Uh, and they had developed the practice of coming down from the, the plains of Central Asia and invading across uh, the mountains and conducting raids and in, not not that they were there to stay but they'd come down pick out whatever was wasn't nailed down and then when the persians went to fight them they would retreat back into their homeland and so Cyrus, uh, D darius gets the idea that he's going to try to to conquer the Scythians, but every time he goes up there to attack them, they just retreat into their homeland, and and you know it's it's not just going over the mountains, but but there, there's a lot of Asia in which they can retreat, and so Darius gets the idea he's going to circumnavigate the Black Sea, and he'll come up behind the Scythians and trap them from behind. And accordingly, he starts off on his journey. Of course, the Scythians, they just uh, move further into Asia. It, it, it's a failed mission. But in the midst of that mission, he expected to get a bit more help from the Greeks, and, and the Greeks snubbed him. They weren't at all interested. And they had seen him defeated, and so they began to think to themselves, gee, maybe Darius isn't such a, a big bad king after all. What this leads to in Ionia, those cities, those Greek cities on the western side of Anatolia, is that those Ionian cities go into revolt. And when they revolt, they are assisted by their Greek counterparts, like the city-state at Athens and, and a few others, who send them some ships and offer them moral support and, and even a little financial help. Now, Darius puts down the Ionian revolt. But then he's out now to punish the Greek city-states, especially the city of Athens, that help participate in that. 
And so he takes a fleet of ships and he sails across the Aegean, coming to a place called Marathon that's just up the coast from Athens. He has his armies. They outnumber anything the Greeks are going to uh, confront him with. And on the shores near a town called Marathon, he lands with his ships. Here on our map, we have the Persian armies uh, in, pictured in red. And they outnumber the Greeks. The Greeks, in order to not to get outflanked, the Greek commander stretches their lines in the middle, makes their center very weak, with heavier forces on each flank. And as the Greeks move to attack the Persians, initially the Persians are able to push that Greek center uh, far in array, but then the Greek flanks are able to turn and come against the Persians and rout them, enveloping the center. So the result is that we have a great victory at Marathon. At Marathon, the Persians are defeated. Uh, they get back in their ships. Uh, they sail around to the other side to, to confront. Maybe they think this time we'll come at Athens from the south. The Greeks by this time have relocated, uh, are, are waiting for them. And the Persians say, well, let's not do that again. And they turn around and they go back home. And so Darius's attempt to punish Athens and to punish the Greek Greeks had ended in failure. Now, Darius dies about four years later, and his son Xerxes now comes to the throne. And he is faced by rebellion in the empire. Uh, Babylon and Egypt both revolt, and, and he spends some time putting those revolts down. And then he sets his attention back to Greece. He's going to try to invade Greece. And he's not going to do like his father did. Instead, he's going to come uh, from a, instead of just sailing across the Aegean, he's going to uh, move up near Troy, and he will come build a bridge across the Hellespont uh, by tying um, boats together, ships together, a vast movable pontoon bridge. In fact, when a storm comes up and, and wrecks the bridge, uh, he uh, orders the execution of the bridge builders, of the, of the engineers, has to go get new engineers to rebuild the bridge now. And then he builds not one, but two or three bridges and crosses his army ac across the Hellespont in mass. The Greeks tell the story, don't know if it's true, um, that he also orders the sea to be whipped for having destroyed his pontoon bridges. I wonder sometimes if the Greeks aren't making some of this up. It might be a, a bit of propaganda. In any case, he marches across the Hellespont through the northern part of modern-day Greece, which is called Macedonia, coming at last to a place called Thermopylae. At Thermopylae, he is met by a small group of Spartans. Now, the Spartans were way down in southern Greece. Um, and, and they had really suggested, remember, Greece is not a unified country. And so the, the Spartans had, had suggested to their Athenian neighbors, why don't we uh, why don't make, make our defense, we'll just give Athens to the, to the Persians, we'll make our defense at the Peloponnesus, that is, at where Corinth is. And the, the Athenians don't like that. So, so finally the Spartans send a small force of about 300, along with some uh, other forces, so actually the total Greek force is probably more in the neighborhood of about seven, eight, nine thousand, 9,000, uh, but still a relatively small force facing the Persians. And they're under the command, though, of this Spartan king. Uh, Leonidas is his name. And here at the Battle of Thermopylae, the Persians have their just mega hosts, uh, the reports, if we can believe them, and I'm not sure that we can, uh, but the reports describe an army in excess of a million men facing this little tiny band uh, who are able to hold them off, however, because Leonidas has arranged the defenses at a place here at the Pass of Thermopylae that have huge cliffs on one side and the sea on the other side. 
Here's a picture of modern day Thermopylae. Uh, land masses have probably changed somewhat uh, due to, to erosion, but you still have these big cliffs coming down to this small pass. And here for a time, a few days at least, the Greeks and Spartans especially are able to hold off the Persians. However, when a renegade Greek shows the Persians a pass through the mountains, they are able to come up behind the Greeks and trap them there. Most of those Greek forces dissipate or are sent home, but the Spartans, the 300 Spartans under Leonidas, remain to the last man and are killed rather than abandon their post. Leonidas and his 300 Spartans become a symbol of Greek desire for freedom, their passion for freedom against the Persian onslaught. Um, this story uh, was attempted to be told by a recent Hollywood movie called The 300. Unfortunately, they paid very little attention to historical detail. Instead, uh, the movie is based on a comic book, and so unfortunately I can't recommend it. The Persians go on from here to capture Athens, but by the time they do, most of the Athenians have fled to the south to an island off the coast by the name of Salamis. It is at Salamis that the Persian navy comes in and is confronted by the Greek fleet. The Greeks had uh, been led by a general by the name of Themistocles, who had heard a prophecy that Athens would only be saved by her wooden walls. Themistocles took this prophecy not to be a reference to literal wooden walls, but instead to the Athenian fleet of ships. Accordingly, when the Persian navy engaged the small Greek fleet in the Bay of Salamis, the battle ended in a decisive Greek victory, even though the Greeks were vastly outnumbered by the Persian fleet. Um, it, was, it was a relatively small area. The Persian ships were not able, able to have the maneuverability they would have wanted, and the Greeks came away with a wonderful victory. The Persian forces uh, were left, uh, actually uh, Xerxes leaves the area, he goes back to Persia, sort of disgusted by the whole thing. The Persian forces are left there to fight one more battle the following year. Uh, again, it ends in defeat for the Persians, and this time the Persian Empire uh, retreats from Greece, never to come back. Now, Xerxes uh, goes back home, and that's where we read of the story of Esther, taking place. Now, we don't read the, the name Xerxes in the book of Esther. Instead, he is called Ahasuerus. That seems to be either another name or perhaps even a title for the king, but most historians do believe that Xerxes is the king who is being pictured in that story. Xerxes uh, is finally assassinated in 464 BC. His son comes to the throne. Uh, Xerxes is, is you know assassinated. He's buried and now his son Artaxerxes the first, because there's going to be another one a bit later. Artaxerxes is going to reign for the next 40 years, and he has a new policy toward the Greeks. Uh, his policy will be to financially support the enemies of Athens, but he's not going to try to uh, invade anymore. Uh, accordingly, when uh, Themistocles, the hero of Salamis, um, uh, finds himself at odds with his fellow Athenians. He's ostracized by Athens. Um, Artaxerxes gives him sanctuary. Um, it's also at this time during the reign of Artaxerxes that we have the commission of Ezra, who is allowed to take a uh, number of the Jews back to uh, Canaan and, and uh, again to, to further resettle in uh, Jerusalem and to uh, continue the work of rebuilding Jerusalem. It's also during the time of Artaxerxes that Nehemiah is sent back. So actually we have not uh, one or two, but three different returns of the Jews. Nehemiah comes back, this time to build the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Um, if we look at those three returns, notice that we have the first return, Ezra chapters 1 through 6, uh, and then Ezra chapters 7 through 10 take place uh, about 50 or 60 years later, and then the third return that's told in the book of Nehemiah. The dates on that... Uh, 538 B.C. our first return, 
Uh, 60, 70, 80 years later, later we have the second return, 458 BC, and finally the, the third one with Nehemiah in 444 BC. So we have Zerubbabel, that's the first, then Ezra, then Nehemiah. That first return had been under Cyrus. Both of these, the second and the third return, are now under the reign of Artaxerxes. Uh, Artaxerxes Lang, uh, Langaimenos, as he's also known. Um, that first decree was that as many as who wanted to come back could go back and rebuild the temple. Uh, remember, they were delayed, but ultimately they got that done. Uh, under In the days of Ezra, they received permission to return and to establish uh, and rectify the worship in the temple. Uh, you know, things were, had started to get off track a bit. And then when Nehemiah goes back, he has permission to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, in that first return, we had had the prophets Haggai and Zechariah. Um, and then in that last return, it's probably around there that we have the prophecy of Malachi, although there's not a clear link up between those events. Now, Jerusalem now is rebuilt and expanded far beyond what it had been back in the days of David and Solomon. Uh, the days of David and Solomon, you'd had that old city of David. Notice on the, the lower right-hand portion of our map, it, it pictures what that old city looked like. Um, Jerusalem is growing, and it's growing much bigger, and it's going to continue to grow over the next hundred, several hundred years. It's an artist's conception of Jerusalem in the days of Nehemiah and, and going on after the end of the Old Testament era. Now, after the death of Artaxerxes I, he has three sons, um, and each are going to reign, although not very long. We begin with Xerxes II, who is the oldest, um, but after only 45 days, he's murdered by his brother, Secadianus. And Secadianus, um, he is in turn killed by Darius II, who is now the survivor and, and reigns for a number of years. It's under Darius II that we have uh, these elephantine papyri that tell the story of a group of Jewish settlers who have settled down here in southern Egypt on the island of the elephants. We have these papyri where they are writing asking permission to rebuild a temple that they've had here that has been destroyed. We don't know much about the details, um, but that reflects that there are Jews here that are worshiping God. They're worshiping, as they call him, Yahoo, that's short for Yahweh. Um, they're worshiping God down here in southern Egypt. Now, also, it's during this period that we have Greeks fighting Greeks in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, it's a story of the Athenians fighting, fighting uh, the Greeks of Sparta. Uh, and it's uh, really a story of, of sea versus land battle because the Athenians, they are masters of the sea. The Spartans are masters of the land. And uh, I guess you could say it's like a grizzly bear fighting a shark. And uh, uh, it doesn't go well for either one. It, it actually lasts something in the order of, of nearly 30 years uh, before Sparta finally wins the battle. Now, after Darius II, he dies, and we have, again, two sons. And whenever you have two sons, that's going to leave the possibility for a civil war, and that's exactly what happens now in Persia. Uh, the, uh, the reigning king, Artaxerxes II, is challenged by his brother, Cyrus III. And Cyrus III, in, in order to uh, amass enough people to, uh, to fight this battle, to fight this civil war, he hires... Uh, a number of mercer mercenaries, Greek mercenaries, including one Xenophon. And the reason he's so important, he's going to write a story about it. Um, Cyrus versus Artaxerxes, they fight an epic battle. The battle takes place at a place called Kunaxa on the Tigris River in central uh, Mesopotamia. And Cyrus III dies in the middle of the battle, even though um, his forces have won the battle. Uh, so here's Xenophon, the victorious general. He's just won a battle, but all of the other Persians on his side, seeing that the brother has died that they were following, they go over to the other side. And now Xenophon and his 10,000 Greek mercenaries are behind enemy lines with hostile Persians all around them. What do they do? They fight their way north following the Tigris River and then all the way up to the Black Sea and make their way all the way back home to Greece fighting all the way. Which tells all of the Greeks Persia isn't as strong as they look. 
if these Greeks could fight their way out of Persia, what is to stop other Greeks from fighting their way into Persia? And that's going to happen a hundred years later at the hands of a Greek by the name of Alexander the Great. When Artaxerxes III comes to the throne, uh, perhaps learning a lesson uh, from the previous generation, his first official act is to murder all of his relatives, regardless of their age, their gender, uh, everyone has got to go uh, so that he can be the only surviving one. Uh, he rules for a number of years, uh, and then he is assassinated uh, by a court eunuch by the name of Bagoas. Bagoas assassinates him in order to put one of the younger sons of Artaxerxes upon the throne, Arsis, uh, but Bagoas uh, has chosen this son because he wants to be able to, to pull all the strings. Uh, when Arsis doesn't act quite the way he uh, wants him to, uh, Bagoas poisons him as well, and now puts a, another nobleman by the name of Darius, who's going to be Darius the Third upon the throne. Uh, Darius the Third sees which way the wind is blowing and has Bagoas himself put to death uh, before uh, he himself can can be taken and assassinated. Darius the Third is finally a strong king who can maybe take the faltering Persian Empire and put it back on track, but he's not going to get a chance to do that. Instead, we have the coming of a Greek, Macedonian to be sure, Alexander the Great, who within the space of 10 years will march through the Persian Empire, conquering the Persians and marching all the way to India. But we'll tell that story next time.